Hey everyone, uh, Mr. David. Last of the three series here on the U.S. Civil War. We started with a look at the early to late 1850s and into 1860 with the causes of the U.S. Civil War. Last class, we took a look at some of the fighting, including matching up the Union versus the Confederacy and kind of how they stacked up against one another. And then today what we're going to do is we're going to wrap up the fighting and talk about some other kind of serious developments that occur um, throughout the U.S. Civil War. And like I said, I'll be discussing some battles and things like that. And AP does not is not necessarily going to ask about a specific battle or something. But again, as you can kind of tell, there's a certain timeline and there's a certain kind of trend to the way the war goes and so being able to place things appropriately will help in your understanding towards it so we're going to take place or take off i guess right after we left off last time which is after antietam and in case you kind of forgot i'll just kind of remind you the union has their biggest victory up to this point at the battle of antietam and if you remember, this was a decision by Robert E. Lee and the Confederacy to go on the offensive and kind of sacrifice one of their major um, advantages that they had, um, and they do end up losing. And it's against this backdrop, or this context, I guess, of Antietam that Lincoln will issue the Emancipation Proclamation. And remember, this frees slaves in all the rebelling states which is obviously significant within and of itself. But the bigger kind of takeaway at this point is that this is pretty crushing for the Confederacy because it means that no foreign intervention is going to come in on the side of the Confederacy. Um, again, you would not, you know, again, Britain or France are not going to involve themselves with a war on slavery. Certainly, they're not going to support the side that supports slavery. And so that's a pretty crushing blow for the Confederates. It would seem after Antietam that, hey, this is a moment for the Union. Let's capitalize on this victory that occurs here in Antietam. Um, let's capitalize on kind of some of our increased morale and some of the decreased morale of the Confederacy. Let's get it going. Um, the reality is, though, unfortunately for the Union, that will not happen. And soon after Antietam, the Union loses at the Battle of Fredericksburg. Okay, so that's obviously problematic. Um, that was basically the next battle up in the northern Virginia area. So, okay, that's so that definitely pulls away a lot of the momentum that was previously had. Um, there's also fighting going on in the west, in particular at um, Vicksburg, which is in Mississippi. Um, the Union was really looking for a big victory at Vicksburg um, in the hopes that if they were able to gain control, they would gain control of the Mississippi um, and that this would be kind of demoralizing for the South. Um, fighting starts there in the later part of 1862, uh, but will continue there for quite some time. So just fighting going on there, no real resolve in this regard. Um, the next major battle going on in the Northern Virginia area is going to be at Chancellorsville. Um, this is another loss for the Union. Um, this one is extremely disappointing, especially because the Union had two times as many men um, at Chancellorsville than the Confederacy. But the um, victory at Chancellorsville is probably Robert E. Lee, Robert e. Lee's excuse me, best stroke of genius. And we really see some really impressive commanding and, you know, really impressive military school uh, skills. So just something to kind of be thinking about there. So as we're kind of hitting into 1863, um, Confederate morale is high. Okay. Um, they, they've obviously had some big, you know, victories, obviously. They, they, they're still in this. Um, they've kind of recovered from that blow at Antietam and, you know, the bigger kind of blow from the Emancipation Proclamation. And if you're in the Union right now, uh, there's a lot of concern about what's to come. And so that's really problematic, um, obviously, for many reasons. Um, but this is, you know, not going to be a good situation. Um, this image, by the way, is from Fredericksburg. And then here we see uh, Chancellorsville. 
Okay, so if there's kind of a couple battles that you always want to remember for the U.S. Civil War, one would be Antietam because the Emancipation, Emancipation Proclamation follows afterwards. The other huge battle at the end of the Civil War is going to be the Battle of Gettysburg. And this is the biggest one by far. So let me kind of explain what happens here at Gettysburg um, in the summer of 1863. The Confederacy, as we've kind of been talking about, is doing well. They're having victories, but these victories are taking place in the South, you know, in particular Virginia and things like that. Confederate leaders started to believe that the only way that they were really going to have this big victory or instill this big kind of champion moment was to actually have a victory in the northern part of the country. So because of that, they're going to decide to launch up into the north. Um, again, we saw them do it at Antietam. Didn't work out well. They decide, though, they're going to try it once again. Um, another kind of motivation, just an FYI, is that they did believe that this would ease some of the pressure on Virginia. Um, again, Virginia has been a hotbed. Obviously, if they can launch into the north, that will give Virginia a break. But at the same time, you know, again, just like at Antietam, they're sacrificing a big advantage they have, which is that... Again, now they're going to go on the offensive, which is problematic. Um, this battle will take place for three days in the summer of 1863. Um, and this is the furthest, by the way, that the South will ever launch north, um, actually into Pennsylvania, Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. So the first two days, the Confederacy advances. Um, not enough to necessarily win. But certainly the first two days, the tide is on the Confederate side, and obviously things are looking kind of gloom for the Union. However, on the third day, Lee will decide to charge in what is known as Pickett's Charge. This decision is a disaster, and in less than an hour, Lee's men will suffer about 6,500 casualties in just that one hour of this charge. With that and the other losses that have been sustained over the previous days, the Confederacy will be forced to surrender here. Um, and all of a sudden, the Union has picked up their biggest victory up to this point. Um, I'll show you some numbers, but there are over 50,000 um, casualties as a result of what happens here at Gettysburg. Um, about 28,000 for Lee, which will be about a third of his command, and then for the Union about 23,000. These are big losses um, that make Gettysburg actually the deadliest battle in U.S. history, not even just the Civil War in U.S. history. Amazing. Um, there's been some suggestion as to whether or not Gettysburg is the ultimate kind of turning point of the war. Well, not quite, because war will continue for almost two years after Gettysburg. However, this is close to being kind of the ultimate turning point. The Confederacy will still have some victories after Gettysburg, but they will never again launch into the North. And instead, their, their backs are up against the wall. Um, their morale never quite gets to that high level that it was um, and they're just never really able to recover following what happens at Gettysburg. Um, the Union, once again, will decide not to pursue after the victory. Um, it's no longer, by the way, General McClellan. It's a guy by the name of Meade. This will infuriate Lincoln, who really wants to capitalize on these victories and feels like they're not doing enough in order to, to get there. Um, but a big victory still. Um, and something, you know, worth noting and, and worth being proud of. A, a few months later, they're going to create a memorial, basically, for the bodies and those that have lost their lives in Gettysburg. And President Lincoln will come, and it's at this moment that President Lincoln issues the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, probably one of the most famous, if not the most famous speech um, in American history. Um, in this speech, Lincoln gave credit to those who lost their lives, 
saying that, you know, th this would continue on. Um, he also says something interesting, which is that, you know, kind of pointing to the Declaration of Independence with all men are created equal. So once again, kind of emphasizing here that once this whole thing is done, the United States will not be a country of slavery anymore. Um, this address, again, very short, um, really provides some added morale to the Union, um, and they're feeling good about what's going on and happening. Um, so between the battle and then following with the address, it's a high time for the Union. And again, war will continue for almost two years after Gettysburg, but the South just never really gets to the level that they were before. It's not just, by the way, in regards to Gettysburg, there's other things that are going to happen, which I'll kind of talk about, but that will certainly be a significant moment. Um, again, this battle is very famous, so I do want to show you some images here. Uh, by the way, in case you were wondering this, photography has just come about um, before the Civil War, so that is why we actually do have some photos um, it's just not really widespread at this point, so um, just something to keep in mind. And here we see some more. And this, by the way, is something that I, again, I, I kind of hit at before, uh, but here are your losses by both sides. Um, extreme, what's going on here. And the fact of the matter is the numbers by themselves might seem like, okay, um, you know, they're pretty close. But the reality is um, because the Union has so much more men, um, that kind of loss is not nearly as devastating for them as it is for the Confederacy. And I'll kind of, this is kind of foreshadowing just a tad, but if you want to think about this, uh, Gettysburg alone, the amount of deaths per population um, is bigger than um, almost any war um, up to this point, except maybe the American Revolution, just Gettysburg by itself. Um, but look at this next graph, which shows the total amount of deaths per 10,000 um, in the entire Civil War. It far outnumbers any other war beforehand. And this is Lincoln given his uh, Gettysburg Address. Um, again, a, a, a pretty historic moment. Um, and again, it was interesting when they were dedicating this uh, burial place for the fallen soldiers, Lincoln was not the featured speaker. Um, it was somebody else. And there's kind of some stories back and forth, but a lot of the stories kind of point to the fact that Lincoln actually hadn't really created the speech until he was taking the train ride over. Um, that's kind of been debated back and forth. There's a lot of thought that he at least created some of it, but maybe he was adding a couple things here and there. But again, his speech is by far one of the more significant ones um, in United States history. Okay, after Gettysburg, things start to really shift and really turn for the Union in a good way. Why? Well, remember, I mentioned Vicksburg and, you know, this fighting going on in Mississippi well, now, successfully, Vicksburg will be captured by the Union. And again, the location of Vicksburg in Mississippi, basically on the Mississippi River, um, and the fact that the Union has been able to take it over means that the Confederate war effort is going to be basically divided. You've taken away that major um, center, the, the Mississippi, in order to transport supplies, troops, etc. So this is a pretty big deal that the Union's able to take control. As far as uh, military leaders, this is the point where Ulysses S. Grant becomes the new kind of major general in control. Ulysses S. Grant was a very unlikely hero. Although he had military experience and although he had graduated from West Point, he's not really the type of person that we would expect to be the hero of the U.S. Civil War, okay? Again, there were several other generals of the Union before Grant uh, that seemed much more qualified and much like they were going to be able to be much more successful versus Grant, who before the war was basically an alcoholic farmer. 
Okay, but something Grant does that the previous generals before him had not done is that Grant is going to be willing to lose men. Okay, and after Grant takes over, we're going to see massive casualties take place. But the idea from Grant was, hey, we have far more soldiers, we have far more access to men than the Confederates. So if we go to battle and we lose 20,000, but they also lose 20,000, or even if they lose like 18,000, 17,000, we're going to be okay and we're going to be able to replace them, but the Confederacy will not. And this is one of the reasons why, by the way, there's such a high death count um, of the U.S. Civil War. There's also a lot of disease and, again, like crude medical practice, but it is important to realize that this is a dynamic and something that's happening uh, that we do want to acknowledge and give credit for. Amidst kind of this change in strategy and finally the Union having a good commander, um, and again, the capture of Vicksburg, the war is not over by any stretch, okay? Um, the Confederacy is still fighting. Um, you know, Lee is not going to give up, and we know that Lee is a great military general, so again, having to beat him is not going to be easy. Um, in addition, the Confederates are looking to November of 1864 when the election of 1864 is scheduled for and the Confederates hoped that Lincoln would be elected out of office and somebody else would become the president who would be willing to uh, maybe compromise with the South or end the war favorably on Southern terms, which Lincoln had made it pretty clear at this point he was not willing to do. So Confederacy still feeling pretty good about their chances and they feel, you know, with all this stuff going on, um, even with some Union momentum. In addition, there's another um, military general that is going to become the major guy in the western part of fighting known as William Tecumseh Sherman, and I'll bring him up in a little bit, but he's going to be working out in the west and kind of dealing with everything going on there, um, which leads Grant in the kind of northern Virginia area dealing with that kind of stuff. Um you know, as 1863 continues on, then we're now into 1864, the Confederates are in a pretty serious soldier problem. Um, again, because of all the lives lost and because they're pulling from less people, um, they are now having people eligible to be conscripted up to the age of 50. Um, again, that's pretty, you know, old. But again, because of the fact that they have lot low numbers, this is what they have to do. The Union is actually going to have a little bit of a crisis themselves, which is that most of the people that had signed up or had been conscripted were on a three-year. And now we're entering into the end of the third year by, you know, the summer of 1864. So actually, kind of interestingly enough, um, the Union will offer these soldiers... Um, some time, uh, uh, some time off, about a month off, and then some extra money if they decide to stay. And although some will leave, most will reenlist. Thus, meaning that again, the Union can kind of capitalize on their numbers advantage to get things in the right direction. Um, again, as war continues, we have Lee and Grant kind of battling each other. I mean, their commands obviously um, in the northern part of Virginia, and again. Um, Grant is an unlikely hero, but, you know, he does, you know, he squares up relatively well against Lee, um, especially over time. Um, so that is good. But again, probably the advantage going to Lee. Um, Sherman at this point is going to move into, um, the Atlanta, uh, region and he, well, he sets his sight at least on Georgia and things like that. Um, and that's what he kind of wants to do, kind of set destruction over to the Western theater of the war and into kind of the deeper part of the South. Um, so again, I'll, I'll kind of bring that up a little bit later, but just something to kind of keep in mind here um, that there's that fighting going on as well. All right, so here is the map of Vicksburg so you can see exactly where it is. And again, kind of right there on the Mississippi, um, you know, a strategic point that kind of connected uh, the theaters of war. And now you basically cut the Confederacy in half. So this is a big victory for the Union. And here, by the way, we see Grant um, on the left. 
And then this is uh, Sherman on, on the right, who again is taking over in the uh, western kind of theater of the war. And then again, Grant kind of squaring off with Lee in the Northern Virginia area. Okay, so let's talk about the election of 1864. For many Confederates, this was the big hope that Lincoln would lose and, you know, things might progress a little bit differently. So, like I said, the Confederates really hoped that Lincoln would lose. Um, and again, you know, they thought that, you know, strategy would change. They thought they might be able to come in, um, you know, on favorable terms and, you know, they wouldn't have to necessarily, you know, totally surrender. Um, so that was, you know, really what they were hoping for, especially as the number of men they have access to um, is decreasing. Their inflationary problems are becoming pretty bad. So they're kind of looking at this election as maybe that big point. To be honest, Lincoln and many of his supporters also feared a loss in 1864 August, so um, a few months before the election. And they believed that unless kind of things changed, uh, Lincoln wasn't going to win in November of 1864. So they say, okay, we need Lincoln to win. So what can we do in order to get into that spot? Well, one is that they will make the decision to have a new vice president or not vice president candidate at this point, a guy by the name of Andrew Johnson. Andrew Johnson was from Tennessee. And you might think to yourself, wait a minute, Tennessee, didn't Tennessee secede? Yes, they did. But Andrew Johnson was the only sitting senator not to resign in the entire South when the rest of, when their state seceded. He was the only one that stayed. Um, he was technically a Democrat, but he was about union more than anything else. So he had kind of shifted to, you know, Republican in this realm. Um, we'll kind of get to that a little bit later. It gets messy, but at least as a running mate, Johnson makes sense. Um, because again, he is someone from the South, yet he is somebody that is a, a you know, very much a big supporter of union. He wanted the complete um, abolishment of the slavery, and he also wanted an unconditional surrender of the South. So, okay, seems good. So there's one thing they're going to do. The other thing, though, that's going to happen is by September, things will improve for Lincoln and his odds at election. Johnson, yeah, some, some degree because of that. But the bigger thing that's going to happen is Sherman, as he's gone down, by September, he has basically set a blaze to the state of Georgia. Total and complete destruction. Uh, we refer to this as Sherman's March on the Sea. March to the Sea, excuse me, I'll get to a little bit later in more detail, but that's going to be kind of the uh, big success point, I guess, where it's clear that the, the tide is turning, uh, certainly in the favor of Union, and things are looking up. The Democrats decide to put up as their presidential candidate George McClellan. Yes, the same George McClellan who was the original commander of the Union armies, yet was horrible. And what's very interesting is that this is an election that, as you can guess, is all about war and fighting. And Lincoln says if you know he wins, they're going to continue to fight. And again, kind of the pushing of this unconditional surrender of the South. And McClellan says if he wins... Um, that he would go and negotiate a peace. And this peace would have allowed slavery to continue in the country. I mean, that was what we know the South was motivated by. So there's a lot at stake when we talk about the 1864 election. Well, Lincoln luckily will win. Um, he secures, you know, a big majority of the popular vote, a really big majority of the electoral college vote, which is good. But I think whenever I think of this election, one of the biggest things that I like to point to is the fact that among soldiers, Lincoln overwhelmingly wins. Um, he receives nearly 80% of the soldier vote. And so for him, this was a mandate by not only the soldiers, obviously, but the people that the South was going to unconditionally surrender War needed to be continued to be continued to be fought, and really, this election is kind of a doom point for the Confederacy 
as they now realize their chances of, you know, getting something significant together are largely decreasing. Here we see um, the, the union nomination, again, Lincoln here and Johnson. And here we see um, McClellan and his uh, running mate Pendleton. And what I like about this is this kind of shows um, two, you know, campaign signs. The one for Lincoln, which was opposed to Lincoln, and then the one in support of McClellan. And, um, you know, McClellan was about peace, and, you know, that's what he said he was going to do, and he was going to compromise with the South and, you know, do something in there. And then, you know, look at what he says. He says, oh, you know, the Republicans are the ticket of Negro equality. So another way in which they're going to try to, um, you know, kind of influence events and other things on this regard. And here, by the way, is this map of the election of 1864, uh, remember, the Confederate states don't vote, so that's why, um, you know, there's there's all that brown there. Uh, but, you know, you can see here, although the popular vote is close, er, the electoral vote is pretty overwhelmingly in favor of Lincoln. To be honest, the election of 1864 was, in many senses, the last hope of the Confederacy and when Lincoln wins, it's pretty clear that it's going to move in the direction of the Union. So what happens here? What are some things that go on? Well, first off, Sherman makes his march to the sea. Um, I kind of mentioned that already, but he, he moves this huge uh, march, almost 300 miles from Atlanta to Savannah, causing about $100 million worth of damage, um, will destroy the railway network that was across the state of Georgia um, and really just set a blaze to the state. Um, again, you can see here on the map the way this goes. And the reality is, at this point, the Confederates are really in, in no position to defend against this. So Sherman all, almost kind of goes um, uninhibited, I guess, as he marches towards the sea. Um, and does reach into there. Um, at this point, by about February of 1865, the vice president of the Confederacy, Alexander Stevens, will meet with Lincoln. He says, hey, uh, you know, I think we can get together a, maybe a peace. You know, we'll come to a compromise here, and then we'll, you know, end this war, whatever. And Lincoln says, no. Okay, again, uh, it, it just, you know, FYI, if you want to compromise and you want to end a war, you should at least have something, you know, to offer or some kind of threat. And that's not the case at all uh, by early 1865. And so Lincoln sets out to make sure that the only way this war will end is through unconditional surrender. Um, up to this point, again, we know that the Confederates are having problems with the number of troops. That is continuing on so much so that they will finally decide that they should give the opportunity to fight to slaves. And I say opportunity, obviously kind of sarcastically. The reality is by the time they do that, it is way too late. It would be interesting to consider what might have happened if the Confederacy was willing to utilize slaves for fighting earlier on, but they don't do that. So instead, um, you know, they, they wait till the very end, doesn't work itself out as well. Sherman, already setting the blaze to the state of Georgia, will say, hey, you know what, I'm going to move up to South Carolina. And he starts to kind of do another big destructive blow over in that uh, state. Um, okay, so, you know, it's, it's taken care of, you know, that regard. And then in early April, uh, April 3rd, the Union will officially capture Richmond, the capital of the Confederacy. Again, when you capture the capital, that signals kind of a defeat, or at least defeat being imminent. And a few days later, Lee will formally surrender to um, Grant at Appomattox Courthouse in um, Virginia. So at this point, the war has basically lasted just about four years, um, almost exactly four years. If you remember Fort Sumter, it was April 1861, Confederate surrender at Appomattox, April 1865. Um, so, wow, you know, how this has moved. 
Sherman, by the way, pretty controversial guy, and I just wanted to kind of share uh, some of his quotes as he, again, you know, torches the state of Georgia and really sets a blaze to the South, and uh, kind of our second most important commander of the Union behind Grant. He says, I'm tired and sick of war. Its glory is all moonshine. It is only those who have never fired a shot nor heard the shrieks and groans of the wounded who cry aloud for blood, for vengeance, for desolation. War is hell. Um, I want to burn the world down, burn, okay, you know, um, and then war is cruelty. There's no use trying to reform it. The crueler it is, the sooner it will be over. Here, by the way, some look at the uh, destruction. So this is a painting showing this. And then here's some look at actual destruction from Sherman's March to the Sea in the state of Georgia. Um, again, some more here. What also happened is that Sherman marched. Slaves that were in the region would come and kind of join his ranks. Um, and again, nothing really the Confederacy can do at this point as they were too weak at, at this time to really do anything. Besides, it's becoming increasingly clear that when the Union wins, there will be no slavery. And again, that's clear through the Emancipation Proclamation and clear through the Gettysburg Address. And here, by the way, is a look at Lee in the gray surrendering to Grant in the blue at Appomattox Courthouse in Virginia. And here, by the way, is a look at... Um, the most casualties of the battles. And again, um, you can see here, um, they all are from the Civil War. Um, and again, huge numbers. Gettysburg, over the three days, over 50,000. And then you can see Antietam. Remember, Antietam is the bloodiest single day because that's just one day, September 17th, 1862, with almost 23,000 casualties in just the one day. Here's another look, by the way, at this, your total number of deaths of both sides. The North has more deaths and, um, you know, than the South. But again, uh, the ratio of population favors the North in this. So this is why they're able to be okay, um, especially as, again, at the end, they're totally willing to sacrifice um, and, and let a lot of their soldiers die because they know that as long as the same thing happens with the Confederacy, the Union will be able to replace. The Confederacy will not. Um, again, of all the deaths, battle-related deaths, uh, not the majority. Again, most of these are disease and other things like that. And just so you can kind of see, this is the official duration of uh, major American wars. Um, and you see the Civil War there, um, kind of the third longest behind Vietnam and the Revolutionary War. Now, depending on where you count the uh, second Gulf War, this is first Gulf War here uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan, that would probably exceed. But um, up to then, that was where things were. So again, um, you know, not the longest by any stretch, but the most amount of deaths. As we finish this topic off, I want to kind of end by looking at these things. And when we are back in class, um, I'll bring these up again, but just something to kind of keep in mind here. Um, kind of close your eyes or something like that and place yourself back into 1865. Um, you, there's just been this massive civil war. Um, there's about 620,000 people that have died. Uh, there's a million you know, casualties. The South is obviously destroyed. It's not just Georgia. I mean, war has been fought throughout the South. So, I mean, there's total destruction and damage all over the place. Um, slavery is in complete question or disarray. Um, again, it's technically legal at this point, but that doesn't necessarily seem to be, you know, the future. I, I, probably not. Um, and the country obviously needs to be reunited. Again, 11 states literally have committed treason and have left the country. So the question is, what are the questions, if you're in the United States, do you need to answer and figure out? You know, what are the things that you need to address? And so as we end the Civil War, it's important to realize that, yeah, this one element or era or whatever you want to say is over, but there's still a lot to sort out. And so that's what we'll be looking at um, as we kind of come back into class and, and what comes in afterwards. So thanks again for watching. Like I said, this third one is the shortest, so that's, I guess, some relief there. I um, hope you enjoyed it and looking forward to uh, talking about this stuff a little bit more in class. Um, in the meantime, um, have a great rest of your break or whatever else and talk to you soon. Thanks.